welcome along to the Prevention is the New Cure podcast. We're here discussing all things NHS and health related with a political twist. I'm Steve Bryan, Member of Parliament for Winchester down in Hampshire. I'm the Chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee in the House of Commons. And I'm Helen Stokes-Lampard. I'm a GP in the Midlands. I'm a Chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, a Founder and Chair of the National Academy for Social Prescribing and a few other hats that may or may not be relevant for the day. Brilliant. Well, nice to see you again, Helen. Uh, it's pretty, pretty warm. I'm having a hot flush. And uh, last time uh, on the podcast, uh, which was episode eight, we talked about sex and weather. And we on that on that subject, it's Glastonbury weekend. Oh, Ba-boom. yay. Um, yes. Well, it is also today a special day. Why is it a special day today, Helen? I have heard that it's your wedding anniversary and the fabulous Susie Brine. Yeah. is waiting for her husband to come home and celebrate with her. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, 20, both. 20 years ago today on oh, the longest day. A 20th anniversary. Huge yeah. congratulations. Extra Which somebody special. told me was China. You know, I that's think the, that might be right. What I would like as a present for her is I'd like to get Donald Trump to say China to her. Do you think that would be, a, I mean, as a lady, no. do you think you'd appreciate no, that? No, um, really. Just don't go there. Okay. Seriously, top tip fabulous flowers and an offer for jewelry because all, china doesn't all, work so much in jewelry no, already done fabulous flowers okay good uh, gold and star car- and card and good. uh and taking her taking her out and uh for an overnight stay oh i know I... oh you insufferable romantic that's lovely <laughs> and somebody's even looking after the children so this well it's uh, a relief a night away without children. I don't know what we're going to talk about. We might actually get a word in anyways, but you never know. <laughs> um, and of course, what I'm not doing this weekend uh, is taking her to Glastonbury. Oh. Uh, because, yes, I did mention it once. And, uh-huh. um, and she sort of just looked at me uh, in a kind of do you know me at all way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some people like the idea of Glastonbury. I, I mean, I've been going to Glastonbury since I was quite young. And, and I see people there with push chairs and yeah. buggies and uh, that. Right. That is a labor of love yeah um so yeah so it's glass weekend this weekend and i shall be there um i shall be there overnight on saturday um for the for the guns and roses gig helen oh now you oh steve stop 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 you're just tantalizing now do you like guns um, and roses i do that's my generation steve favorite Come song on. Oh, i'd be enough to say sweet child of mine wouldn't it well you know no it's a big oh. hit i'd have to say patience oh which links back to which links very me nicely being to married for 20 years. <laughs> I was thinking to the pod, but there to we the go. Pod, I was thinking yeah, like a yeah. GP. You're no. pod obsessed, Helen. Oh, um, I know I am. Now, uh, there's a couple of things we're going to talk about. Um, and we've got, the, we've got a guest uh, shortly. But buy one, get one free. Bog off. Oh, bog off So this was, this was something that we wrote in the Child Obesity Plan. Yep. And it was various things that government were going to do alongside the advertising um, restrictions on food high in fat, salt and sugar after the watershed. Uh, or sorry, before the watershed. And oh. that's been kicked in long grass. And then just last weekend, we heard that plans to delay two for one junk food deals have been delayed by the government for another two years. It- it would have meant shops being unable to sell food and drinks in high in fat, salt and sugar using multi-buy deals. Um, this is frustrating and I think short-sighted. Oh, Steve, I despaired too. I had an absolute facepalm moment of, really? You Have you done this? But I have heard one uh, reassuring thing, and that's actually retailers have already responded to what they thought was legislation that was coming in and have changed their deals already. So there are far fewer of these very unhealthy buy one, get one free offers actually happening. But of course, we've got the fear that the retailers will backslide, as it were, and they'll they'll start bringing these in, these deals back in. But really, we should be having the best possible deals on things that help people to live healthier lives and better lives and not prioritize and not incentivize unhealthy living come on we all need all the help we can get right now but let's make the help on the healthy stuff not the unhealthy mm. one of my colleagues um amp for shipley philip davies said that the mm. policy was idiotic nanny state and utterly bonkers um another one of uh, another mp said that it would be catastrophic for people's food bills um Jamie Oliver protested outside Downing Street about it. Good old Jamie. Yeah, well done, Jamie. I mean, I I just think that the reason I say it's short-sighted is because, you know what? It's the people who have the least who have the most to lose from this. Um, And, you know, the inequalities in obesity and then all of the health implications that follow from that. 
it's very, very depressing. Um, but let's just we just have to keep making the argument. Um, yep. and we have to keep keep making the argument that it that it can change can change behavior as we saw with the sugar tax. Now, what was it you wanted to talk about? I've got so many things to talk about, but should we do a bit on vaccines today? Two vaccine yeah. stories have caught my yeah. eye this week. Um now, polio. Polio is a completely preventable disease, and at one stage, the world was well on track to completely eradicate it. But there are two countries in the world where there is still uh, endemic wild-type polio, and that's Afghanistan and Pakistan. So those are countries where there's been great resistance to uh, vaccination. But a new super-engineered polio vaccine has been developed, which is going to be more effective than the previous vaccines um, because there's a concern about polio developing resistance and tolerance. So good news story, a global good news story. This is a disease we can and we should completely eradicate from the face of the earth. That's Bring excellent. On. Well it done. Is. Bring it on. And what was your second one? The second one, this is an, this is your favourite. This is HPV vaccination. So, you oh, know, we yes. talk about the ultimate in prevention is primary prevention, stop cancer from developing at all. HPV vaccine does exactly that. And now the evidence says that only you only need one jab to have very high degrees of protection. So they're changing the national immunisation schedule for young people so that they will only need one HPV jab to get full protection, which I think is great news, far higher chance of getting people to comply with just one jab that, is, that is that is good news I, I mean yeah you know we talked about this before but obviously i i commissioned rolling that out to boys mm. as well as just the girls as it was beforehand and i, I actually had a meeting uh, this morning helen with the movember people oh great and fun. Uh, yep. you know they're 20 years old as well so something in the wow. water they're 20 years old this year and um you know they're sort of morphing into a men's health organization yeah and uh i i was talking to them and it's really interesting they said that you know there's a big conference going on in europe today when they're talking about hpv vaccine among boys so this is great anyway and they said they'd love to come on the podcast sometime so in, in november in november i think we might get the the people from november to sounds come and very timely I, I can't do the tash uh you should try I'm i well i'm i'm not going to try just for just for the avoidance I... of doubt I I think I'm a mod. I'm one of those modern men, Helen. Uh, as you know, what does I'm, that very, mean, I'm a very Steve? modern man. Is I don't. Mm, you don't want itchy stuff on, on your well, face. I'm, I'm quite keen on not being hairy. Mm, okay, you know, well, uh, we can talk about hair removal. It's I mean, a I'm fascinating saying, topic. I'm not saying I've waxed my chest. You know, uh, you, you've just admitted that you've waxed your chest. No, you? I haven't waxed my chest, but you know, I'm just You're saying. Protesting too if much. If I did, I quite yeah, quite, quite prefer the the hairless feel. So I don't really want it well, on the face. Anyway, too much information. Too much information. Uh, so, Better so move thank, on. Thank you for those two things. Let's move on with this. So interesting stuff that we've had come up today. Uh, first one, um, Dr. Steve Taylor. Given that at the NHS Confed conference, which it will be obvious why we're talking about that in a minute, the main speakers spoke about community care being a priority. Why is nothing being done to stabilise GP practices? In fact, the opposite seems to be happening with a lack of funding and destabilising the future of partnerships. Retention is key. Doctor. Well, and I am a GP and I am a partner. And GP practices are very brittle. A lot of them are brittle around the four nations of the UK and Ireland. So this isn't an England only problem. Um, there's a quite a lot of recognition that these are challenges. So we've got the workforce challenge. We've got a pretty burnt out workforce and people leaving prematurely. Retaining GPs is, is a difficult thing at the moment. Although we have got more young doctors than ever starting to train as GPs, we've got more training places than ever. So there's some really positive moves at that end. But clearly, you've got to slow down and stop the hemorrhage of, of, of clinicians and other staff. Um, there have been a couple of really big reports recently. So there was the Claire Fuller stock take, which is what the integrated care systems could and should be doing around uh, general practice to do better, how you can learn from the best. There's been a GP access plan, which has been released. Now, the GP access plan was, was met with... Um, uh, a very mixed response from frontline clinicians and staff on the NHS, mostly because it focused just on access to general practice. I mean, it did what it said on the tin, in fairness, but it didn't provide the wider solutions uh, that Steve is suggesting. Um, but it did talk about some innovation. There was money there for improved telephony and digital tools. There was money there to do some stuff differently and get pathways better. But there is no doubt that general practice is brittle. And if general practice goes under, it puts the whole of the NHS and social care system under more strain and in jeopardy. So 
Uh, yes, Steve, I agree with you. Um, we do need to invest better in this. We do need to shore it up. And I'd love to see a big new general practice plan looking at the totality of it and not just those other bits we've had so far. Mm, interesting. Okay. Um, another one. Um, dear Smooth Steve and Dr. Helen. That's, he didn't really say Smooth Steve. I just as a reference to my, you know, your style. Smooth, my smooth, smooth chest. Smooth chest. Smooth clearly. chest. Yeah. Um, and face. Saw you at King's Fund this week, speaking as I was speaking there earlier in the week about um, cardiovascular disease. Good. Um, how can we prevent cardiovascular disease? Oh, just that minor matter. Yeah. So there's a small question. There's a small question. Well, I mean, a lot of what we've been talking about on the po- on this podcast is, is prevention generally. So you know, there's all the good lifestyle stuff that we should be doing, you know, the way we should be exercising more, looking after our heart health, our physical fitness, uh, looking at what we put into our bodies in terms of our diet, our alcohol intake. Um, there's something about getting our figures measured, so looking out for the, the, the prevention side of getting health checks, having cholesterol checked at appropriate stages, having blood pressure checked at appropriate stages, and if we pick up on problems there, dealing with them. There's also a really interesting argument at the moment uh, argument perhaps too strong a word debate about at which point we use genetic testing to identify people who are at personal higher risk because completely independent of those other risk factors like cholesterol and whether you smoke and whether you're overweight and um, is actually your genetics what what you've inherited what's in your genes and that can't be changed but that gives you a baseline risk as an independent risk factor and would knowing that um change people's risk score and if their risk score had changed would people be more likely and motivated to take uh, influence those other things they have got control over what do you think i think that makes perfect sense um and you know all of the all of the stuff that we talk about on here you know is is obviously prevention but um you know cbd is a major killer and uh, and it's as we discussed before it's not all about familiar um reasons there are lifestyle and environmental reasons as well so no i i would never argue with the doctor anyway well, look, we're gonna cut short our conversation this week because we got a we got a guest let's take a let's take an iced tea break and uh, and then we'll come back with our guest <laughs> Okay, welcome back. We've got a new guest on the podcast, which is um, somebody who will be very well known to to many, many people in the country is Matthew Taylor, who runs the NHS ComFed and is the CEO of that. And um, Matthew, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Matthew. Great to be here. Thank you. Well, Helen and um, I have actually spent the whole day together, so I don't want rumours to start, but we were at the NHS assembly for the rest of the day. We were having a lovely time, but we left early to come and see you, Steve. (laughs) You two arrived together and left together. I'm saying nothing. Uh, actually, so Matthew, last week was NHS Confed Conference in Manchester, and I, I was very fortunate to be able to come up as chair of the select committee and do something on Wednesday night and then speak at some events around ICSs on, on Thursday alongside Patricia Hewitt, who obviously did the Hewitt review. How, how did Confed go for you this year? Was it, was it good? Yeah, look, it was challenging um, uh, for the team because the junior doctor strike was announced two weeks before. You know, we work on this event for months and months and months. And, um, you know, that there was a tough 48 hours. Was it going to go ahead? We decided that it should because, you know, it's not a jolly. It's a huge opportunity for people around the health service to meet, to talk to each other. You know, as, as one ICS chair said to me, I spend all year taking note of interesting bits of good practice and then I use the confed app to arrange to have coffee with people who are doing that practice and think about what I can bring back into my system so that's kind of typical of how people do it but there was a danger that it would be misrepresented as being inappropriate and uh, NHS England as is there won't and I understand that we're kind of pretty risk averse in terms of who they sent and in terms of the, the kind of general advice that went to their leaders but actually it was, I would say, the best uh, event um, ever. And I think there's kind of interesting lessons to learn about, possibly because we had fewer events because so many NHSE leaders didn't come and system leaders didn't come. And there was more time to breathe, more time to to talk. And and saving your blushes, Steve, the, the feedback from the meeting you had with NHS leaders has been absolutely fantastic. People really enjoyed that conversation. So um, we'll get you back next year and maybe, you know, maybe more of your colleagues as well. Let's I raise think, the yeah. profile of the select committee. Don't, yeah. flat, don't flatter him too much, Matthew. But, <laughs> no, keep but, going. but, but he, he likes it too much. Um, <laughs> and I would love to have been there. But picking up on your point about clinicians and the industrial action, yeah, there's something about 
the optics of being at a conference as a clinician when you need to be covering for your colleagues and uh, and that's the way it is but what's brilliant is to be hearing about it and hear the enthusiasm for it regardless and I'm so glad it was a massive success that's excellent Thank so, you. so should we touch on just touch on the industrial action with you Matthew I mean obviously lots of you've been in front of the select committee in in recent weeks talking about it um, to us and you know people are familiar with you being on the on the broadcast media talking about this I mean one of the reasons why I think you 100% were right to go ahead is because, frankly, there is no end in sight to certainly one of these disputes. And just uh, this week, we had the Secretary of State before the Select Committee, and you know, people will have seen reported his comments about the BMA collapsing, his words, uh, the talks. So, you know, they don't seem to be any light at the end of the tunnel, Matthew. Is that fair? Yeah, look, it's a very difficult situation, Stephen. As I understand it, Actually, in the talks, quite a lot of the issues that are about things other than pay have, have gone quite well. And there has been some progress. The problem is pay, uh, I think. And the problem is that the, the, that the BMA don't want to move an inch from their kind of top level demand. Uh, and, you know, I'd imagine that, you know, the inflation figures that have come out will kind of reinforce their sense of, of falling behind. But... You know, I also understand from the government's perspective why, you know, talking about a figure as, as high as 35 percent feels like it drives the coach and horses through the kind of inflation strategy. So, yeah. you know, I can see this from both perspectives. I can see it from the junior doctors well-made case for the way in which they've fallen behind the issues of recruitment and retention, well, not so much recruitment, but retention. But I can also see it from the government's perspective. And somehow we've got to move into a kind of conflict resolution mode on this um but but yeah it is pretty gloomy right now steve i have to admit mm. yeah hearing very similar things and i think there are some big pivotal points coming in the coming weeks steve where we've got um the results of what's happening with the royal college of nurses ballot we've got the consultant doctors in england ballot results coming out both of those are next week um also there's a lot hanging on the uh, doctors and dentists review pay body um, and what they say. Now, we know that's been sitting with government for weeks. Um, and until that's in the public domain, I think there's going to be a hiatus. But of course, in the meantime, the next set of dates in July is going to be coming towards us. So the, absolutely, Matthew, I think the we all parties round the table talking, because if there's no talk, there is absolutely no chance of progress. Mm. I think the other issue, Steve, which is a point that I emphasised at Confed Expo, is that through the planning round that NHSE has held with systems and trusts, Every leader I speak to says that they have agreed to budgetary and performance targets that are absolutely at the outer extreme of what is possible. And so they really do need everything to go right if they're going to stay within budget and if they're going to meet the targets they've got. And, and in that kind of context, every day of industrial action takes a, a task which was already Herculean and starts to make it almost impossible. Yeah. yeah. And of course, one of the five pledges is cut the waiting list and they're going yeah. in the wrong direction. Although I think the last junior doctor strike last week had lower turnout than previously. But even so, the, the numbers of operations and procedures that are cancelled as a result of it are, are eye watering. Anyway, look, it's great. Steve, to have can you I just on. ask on that? Sorry to yeah. keep interrupting. That is the what this is you, you know you're, you're you should never have got me on because everything is fascinating to me. But <laughs> I don't know if you heard, but I asked the Secretary of State. What exactly is the waiting list pledge? And I think I, heard you. I think he said it's long waits more than its total numbers, which I think is wise. But I still think there's a certain amount of ambivalence. Do you think that's because the government wants to have enough different potential interpretations to be able to point at the one that's going in the right direction? Because I certainly think that the total number is a kind of weird thing to focus on because actually it's a function of the health service affecting operating effectively that more people get on the waiting list yeah. in some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, in cancer, for instance, cancer is currently a victim of its own success in mm. that there are more people than ever presenting. And of course, that's adding to the cancer backlog. But that is a good thing because we want people to come forward with signs and symptoms of cancer. You're possibly right, Matthew, um, about picking the one that works i mean you know you, you there's no other way of looking at halve inflation there's no other way of looking at reduced debt um so that one there is wriggle room in but ultimately you know the public won't be fooled because they will know if they're waiting for that knee or that hip 
um, and you're not going to you're not going to slip that past them. And um, the, the, the public really are hurting. You know, the long waits are really, really hurting. You know, I'm still a frontline GP in all this. And a significant proportion of every clinical day is taken up with waiting list management. The person yeah. who's crying because they're in pain, the person whose life is on hold, who can't work, who's now economically not viable uh, until they're sorted, or who is just paralyzed with fear waiting for that next investigation. So the, the social impact of this is phenomenal too. But no, we Steve, need to Steve, get can onto... I, can, Steve, can I do your job and, and yeah. offer a segue from this yeah. conversation to what I know you really want to talk about? So I just was reading a brilliant case study about um, a piece of work done in Sussex where they had an MSK waiting list community day. They brought, invited everyone on the MSK, the musculoskeletal um, waiting list, to a community day. The clinicians came, spent the whole day. It was very user-friendly, lovely space, really open conversations. At the end of that process, 50%, 50% of those people took themselves off the waiting list because they'd agreed to a self-care plan. I thought, what a fantastic example, wow. yeah, of how, of, of kind of, I mean, it's even kind of beyond secondary prevention. It's, you know, you, if, if you if you have a conversation with people, there, there are a lot of people on waiting lists who will say, actually, I don't need to be on the waiting list. Now you've told me how I can look after myself. Yeah, Proactive, yeah. empowering, engaging, patient choice, love it. It's personalised prevention, almost, isn't it? Mm. Now, now, Matthew, Helen and I have uh, been doing this podcast for a while now, and uh, there are certain people who have become the apple of our eye, uh, almost as if they're going to get some sort of podcast fellowship um, because they're talking our language. And uh, it turns out that you have written a, a systems narrative to prevention and uh, talked about a sort of suggested framework, and it's up on the NHS Confed website for those who who want to read the full thing, and we'll put it in the in the chat on on social media when we put this episode out. Just tell us, Matthew, what is your thesis? Where did why did you decide to put this down? Thanks, Steve. Now, and I'm and I'm looking at the clock, and I promise you this answer will only be two minutes. So. The reason I wrote it was because I got a bit demoralized by constant conversations about prevention, which seemed to me to conflate all sorts of different things. And, and in particular, because my way of looking at the world is, to, is, is kind of to try to understand resistance to change barriers. Why, why is it difficult to do things that everybody thinks we ought to do? And what I came to was we need to divide up what we mean by prevention, not just because I, I love a typology um, as a social scientist, but because actually, if you break it up, what you see is that the barriers are different in each of the domains that I described. So briefly, and I talk about this framework as the MEPS framework, that's the, the initials of it. So the first is medical. So medical prevention is essentially about good clinical care. It's basically all clinicians ought to be working to try to get move up the pathway to become better at getting in to to reaching patients earlier to intervening earlier uh, and and eventually you know intervening way which stops illnesses developing in the first place so that's just good clinical practice when i say it's just i mean it's really hard to do but that's where the nhs can do it by thinking about different kind of pathways the second is is e the environmental and what i mean by that is the ways in which we influence the environment in ways in which uh, damage our health or can help us so that's air quality that's you know smoking regulation alcohol food whether or not councils put chicken shops near secondary school gates all that kind of stuff largely falls under the kind of public health umbrella of, of what local government does the third domain is what i call public and what that's about fundamentally is how do we encourage the public to do the right thing and that's on the one hand you know eating well and not doing unhealthy things getting exercise but on the other hand it's the way they use the health service and that's going to grow in importance because of the ever greater opportunities for people to undertake diagnostic tests so that's going to become you know we will soon i think be in a world where people will people who've got the confidence will be almost continuously monitoring their health not waiting till they get ill and then the fourth area, the S, are called social. And in there, the challenge is how do we persuade organisations, everyone from the Treasury in Whitehall through to a housing association, for whom health is not their number one priority, to take health seriously, to recognise the contribution they can make to improving 
public health. I was in Walsall a couple of weeks ago, one Walsall, great place body. The presentation they made to me wasn't from the health service, it's from the housing association or the registered social landlord who'd first had volunteer um, uh, uh, social prescribers and then employed social prescribers to the housing association. So my point is, in those four domains, the first barrier is around clinical clinical engagement redesigning pathways the second barrier is probably investment in public health and regulation the third barrier is around having really clear messages to the public and reaching those members of the public who have lower sense of trust and efficacy and the fourth area is how do we work collaboratively at national and local levels so that people outside the health system share our objectives Brilliant. I love this framework, Matthew. I really do. Because, I mean, you're talking my language for start because you've put as much emphasis onto the public and self-ownership and control and the social side of it and those wider things, as the great example from Walsall, as you have on the medical environment. Now, that's, it's a neat acronym, but it breaks it down beautifully. Picking up on the social, you talked about the Walsall example and the role of social prescribing. I mean, I see a, a real sort of triad of care coordinators, health coaching and social prescribing when done well as being this amazingly empowering cluster of resources that we can put in to help people in all this space. And I think being more overt about what we're doing there and what I think what's helpful with the framework is that it makes it, it gives structure and narrative to something that's happening in an ad hoc way. So thank you. We'll take this as a gift. What would you like to see done with it? So I, I hope, uh, you know, all I really care about is, 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 is practical change, you know, um, and so I hope it might be a framework. And I say this with a lot of humility, because I am intervening in an area where there are people who've got decades of, 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 of hands on experience, ranging from kind of academics through to public health practitioners. But I hope it'll be a tool. We at the Confed have been organising for about over a year now, a forum for directors of public health, the public health community and systems, because we were aware of the fact that people in local government, when, when the NHS started banging on about health inequalities and prevention, kind of went, yeah, great. Well, we've been trying to do this stuff for years with, with ever diminishing funding. So how can we bring those communities, the NHS systems who care about outcomes and health inequalities together with the public health people who've been doing it? So maybe this is a framework that they could use. But I also, the other final thing I'd say is I, I kind of want to do it, I want it to be used because actually, although money is relevant, it isn't the only factor or arguably it isn't the main factor in all these domains. Because sometimes I think prevention, we just we can't do it because we've got enough money. Well, actually changing the way clinicians work, clearer messages to the public, working with our partners these are all things that don't actually require necessarily money but they they require different kinds of intervention so we can do more without you know without necessarily needing the government to create some massive prevention pot even though that would be great if they did it yeah and i love the way that you talk in your social bit about you know all the in you talk there in your answers about the different parts of government and that's what we're trying to do on the select committee with the prevention inquiry and that's why we have the 10 work streams because as as we've said so many times and i've said at your conference last week most of them got nothing to do with the nhs so you know that's why you know gove's department um hopefully his select committee chair will guest with us when we talk about healthy places to live and you know we'll get the defra chair to guest with us when we talk about air quality because as you say it's cross government can, can i just ask you about and that, dwp you know, steve really important dwp uh, yeah, and getting people yeah. back to work you know yeah 100 can i just ask you about the the, the politics of it though because obviously you know you're you're well known as broadcaster now and with confed and but you know you come from political background and you were in tony blair's number 10 of course you, know, you were the the head of the policy unit weren't you from 2005 presumably up until 2010 or certainly during Tony's time but what was it like working with Blair and you know in all the conversations that you had with him about health did you you know what was the conversations within government then about this stuff reaching across government and public health change and prevention being something that actually stems demand into the health service was 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 it got then do you think no to be frank Steve you know I I am a proud to be have been a part of that administration and proud of the things that were achieved but actually this really wasn't Tony's mm. thing at all he was really focused on you know the kind of new public management reforms of the health service you know the internal market foundation trusts and all of that kind of stuff and and sadly also the disastrous IT program um so 
you know, if I talked to Tony about prevention, public health, social determinants, I think he would have said, as he often did say to me, look, Matthew, the rest of the cabinet will be interested in that stuff and want to talk about that stuff. But I've got to do the kind of hard edge, difficult reform stuff. That's what I'm going to focus on. So, yeah. you know, and, and actually, you know, I think it's a, a, a debate for another time. I think that the way Labour reformed the health service was appropriate for the time and achieved progress at the time. But then I think like the whole new public management agenda across the world, it's just run out of steam. And we've moved on to a different kind of place in terms of thinking about about how it is we make change in public services. But but no, I, I don't want to pretend that I would have been talking about this stuff with Tony because he just wouldn't have been listening, to be honest. Yeah, but I mean, it's good that the the, the current Labour leader, Keir Starmer, you know, who did his big health speech a few weeks ago, you know, and he talked about prevention. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, this, we have, this is, we you know, yes, I'm, I'm a government MP, but, you know, I chair a cross-party committee and, you know, where's, where's Streeting said he, kindly come on the podcast at some point and yeah. the sector of state would be welcome to as well um you know th but more more people who are talking about prevention whether that be in the government or in the official opposition who you know polls to be believed will, will, will take over at some point um that's a good thing isn't it it means that we're winning the argument yeah yeah i mean for me right now uh, from the confed perspective the challenge is to try to encourage politicians to talk about the things that matter and the things that are for the long term you know and that's why you know my speech to confed expo i talked about those kind of five critical things that we need a health policy not just an nhs policy that we need sustained investment particularly thinking about capital and workforce that we need that leftward or upstream shift of resources into public health and prevention community that we need to invert the pyramid and devolve more so that we can work better with our local partners and finally that we need a new conversation a new social contract with the public we say these things and it's important that we say these things and i think the nhs assembly's 75 year document published quite soon will say some of these things as well um because the danger is that as elections approach, as you know, Steve, it all becomes about the retail offer. Mm. It all becomes about kind of fighting for a the NHS becomes a political football and B it all becomes about who can make the biggest promise about target A or target B or target C. And, and we've really, I think those of us, whether it's you in the select committee or me in the confed or Helen on behalf of client clinicians need to kind of say, well, look, some of this is inevitable, but can we also talk about the things that matter and that are long term? Yeah. Matthew, we've kept you an awfully long time, and I'm conscious of that. One last question, going back to something you said earlier before we wrap up with you. Um, you talked about the public and incredible opportunities for citizen engagement in their own health and well-being, and that is absolutely to be welcomed so long as it's done in appropriate ways and the people are using tools that are validated and so on. So there's there's an evidence bit of me about that. But there's also a great worry for me about the digital divide and how we have to be so cautious about systems accelerating one way where we're going to exacerbate that divide. Any thoughts on that and how we can do it better? Yeah, I, I have a strong view on that, which is that there's two wrong positions and one right position. So the two wrong positions are to say, well, you know, 95 percent of people have got you know, Wi-Fi, so let's not worry about the 5 percent or 95 percent of people can use, you know, mobile phone. So don't be complacent about it, particularly because that 5% or 10% are the most likely to be the one, the people we, who most need our help. Yeah. But on the other hand, don't not take things forward because 100% of people can't use them because otherwise we won't ever progress. The right view is to say, okay, 95% of people can benefit from this, 5% can't. So what do we need to do that enables those 5% to be able to access it? Let's close the divide. So let's not ignore it and let's not be stopped by it, but let's be really imaginative. And actually, you know, we've got an example of that, which is what we did in COVID and the vaccination. You know, there are there are groups with less confidence, less trust. But if we really put our mind to it, we can connect with those groups as long as we, you know, we work with community organisations and others. So uh, so let's yeah. see this as a problem to be solved, not something to be ignored or something that's going to block progress. Totally that's agree. Brilliant. Yeah. And it's for me, there's something about using the resource that we save for the 95 percent and applying Precisely. it to the 5 percent. And let's Precisely. be courageous about that. I think we're often very fearful about moving resource around the system. Yes. And I think we Precisely. can fight that bullet. 
Matthew, we really better wrap up, but thank you so much for your time. It's been a fascinating conversation. We've covered a lot of topics and we're really grateful for your new framework. Steve, any uh, last words? I've loved it. We, we loved much. it. When, when Matthew came into the select committee, Helen, uh, he, he he was very cool about this, but you know, I told him that I was a fan because <laughs> although I, I love his work at Confed, uh, as he knows what I'm going to say here is that I love the moral mates on Radio 4, which Matthew is one of the regular guests, one of the regular uh, panelists. I'm doing on. it tonight, Steve. Oh, you're doing it tonight. So we're recording Give this on, on Wednesday tea time. And I know it goes out tonight, doesn't it? Yep. Uh, on, a when, on a Wednesday night. And what is the subject tonight? It's the morality of science. And um, it's one of those nights. I, I'm going to say this to you. Uh, anyway, you've got a select, you've got a, you've got a, a very intelligent and, and oh, trustworthy indeed. listenership. So I can tell you this. Sometimes on Moral Maze, you have to argue positions you don't really agree with. And so actually tonight, I'm going to be on the side of... <laughs> don't let morality get in the way of science even though actually that's not what i think because there's two other people on the panel giles fraser and tim stanley and they really want to argue the kind of we need a more moral approach to science so it's one of those nights where i'm gonna to have to be more investigative than outspoken you're gonna have a blast doing that Matthew. you're it. gonna enjoy it <laughs> playing, playing I... the not as much as i've enjoyed this thank you so it's much great for fun it's great fun it's on my bucket list the moral maze one Good day luck. one day thank you so much for joining Cheers. us see you soon bye. bye take care wow wasn't he great Matthew is such good value. He's got this incredible brain. He sees things differently. And I really love that. I love hearing. Yeah, him. I really enjoyed hearing about inside of Blair's Downing Street. Yes. Great question. Well done. You know, yeah. And I mean, he, he was, you know, head of the number 10 policy, as I said. Mm. So, you know, obviously he saw saw inside the box a little bit as well. So anyway, it's been great. Um, been really interesting to talk to Matthew. Interesting to hear about the Bogoff stuff and what have you. Uh, have a lovely night with Mrs. Brian. Congratulations you to you much. both again from all Thank of us. Thank you. I will send your regards to Axel Rose and Slash. Oh, don't. <laughs> if, he tur- if he turns up, you sweet know. Child is, is, sweet child of mine. Sweet child of mine, yeah. This is the Paradise City that is the podcast. Prevention is the new cure. See what I've done there. Um, I love we what you've done there. Uh, yeah, we want to hear from you. Podcast at stevebryan.com. Find us on social media. We will put the links on our social media to uh, Matthew Taylor's uh, prevention framework that we were talking about there. And uh, you can then follow those links and look at it. And we will see you next time for episode 10. Bye. Bye. Bye.